It says I'm still going live. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Pet Supporting Your Pet Through Major Life Changes, I think is what we call this, right? Um, I'm Amy Mahali with Be Well Clinic. I'm really glad for all of you joining me today. So um, I am here, and Padfoot is here. This is my puppy. He's black, so we'll see how good on camera he serves up, but he's going to be the star of the show today because we're going to do some different um, uh, examples with him. So we are going to get started. Um, I'm glad you all are here. I think this class will be a little shorter than normal, which is not a problem. Um, I am a nurse practitioner, not a vet or anything like that. I want to be upfront on that. I have no um, experience besides what I have studied and read in books and experience with my own dog. So let us get started. Um, oh, before we get going, if you have not been on our YouTube Live, it's pretty new for us and you may not be on with other people, there is a chat box um, so you can leave questions um, and comments here. And if you have not signed in to YouTube, you don't have to make a YouTube account. You just need to log in with your Google account. And I believe this chat shows up alongside the video. However, some of the old videos I've looked back and I can't find it. So the chat may not actually show up um, or it may show up when people are saying things. I'm not sure. So I'm definitely going to repeat any question that people have um, if you put it into the chat. So in case that's not there, but it may be a permanent part of this. I thought it was, but I can't always find it. Okay, I am excited for all of you that have come. We'll probably have more joining us as we go. So I have an outline of some basic topics to talk about. So why is this relevant right now? I feel like it's really relevant because there's a lot of change happening. So my puppy and I moved to a different house on uh, the week, the week, week and a half before we started seeing some cases um, of uh, a certain virus here and there was a change there and then the whole situation changed. I was actually also um, had a cold at that time and so he had a major life change of moving to a different house um, without dogs whereas you, usually he has um, other dogs in his house. I was sick, I was home from work more, things changed so um, a lot of you are probably experiencing some amount of change. Maybe your dog's are like, why the heck is my owner home all the time? Um, or, you know, what what are the kids not doing here? Why aren't we going on our normal rides? Um, why are walks at different times? And they also are going to sense your own anxiety um, or stress that's happening. So we do want to make sure that we are taking care of our pets because um, it helps make life easier. And this is important attention time for my puppy. And so... Um, he knows it's all about him, and there's some supplements sitting over here that he wants, so he's giving me attention. So number one thing, what is your dog doing to seek your attention? Um, the very behaviors he's doing right now are ones I can be really annoyed at him for, but um, think about, just like with our kids, we don't get annoyed at our kids because they ask us to eat, right? Um, your dog is trying to figure out what it can give. It, it needs something. It's trying to let you know that. So. As your dog is doing things to ask for your attention, go ahead and respond to that and try to figure out what that is. So there's a few things in a few categories. I want to run through those categories right now that we want to check. Number one, how's my emotional state? Am I in a stress state or am I in a, a relaxed state? Um, is there something that he's picking up on that is making him nervous or uncomfortable or feeling like he can't be safe? Um, for my dog in particular, this breed, um, he's half poodle. Poodles tend to be very independent, and they are what can be called an uh, independent. Mm, there's a great book. I have some book resources that nothing is sponsored. Hi. Yes. What? Okay. Um, nothing is sponsored. Hey, stop. Good boy. Okay, we're going to jump to this because I've invited him on the couch, and he says he's part of the show. Okay, so this is one of the ways that you can help. And I want you to notice your dog's behavior. Anytime you're giving him something that is, you're checking for supplements or essential oils or things like that, which we're going to talk about later, what you want to do, see if you can have a background that you can see. So I want him to be licking and reaching for this. 
I brought a few different supplements. Um, this one he always loves. He's licking and, and excited about this. Now, if I bring a supplement that I'm not sure about, he may smell it. And do you see how he turned away? So this is a way that we can check on what our dog is wanting. So that one he doesn't want. Sometimes he does want this one. Um, and then because I wasn't sure, I actually brought one I know he always doesn't like, which is a garlic supplement. Um, garlic is okay for dogs, but that is not what he's wanting to have right now. Okay, have it. I need you to settle down. Can you get your toy? Yeah. Okay. Let me get back on track. But this is all a great example because when we have dogs, we have to remember that part of what the dog is doing, they're, they're part of our life and they have an important thing. I'm sorry, did I catch you? Yeah. And so we need to make sure that we are being aware of what their emotional state is. And this is not his normal emotional state, so I don't know if he knows that something is going on here. So when we, I am sorry, guys. He's never done this for class. He usually lays right here and is super quiet. Um, when we're looking at, for him, um, I brought out this resource. This book is called Training the Hard to Train Dog. And I, by Peggy Swagger, no sponsors on any of this. Um, this is just a group that I found. I train dogs. I did 4-H dogs. I had a, a standard poodle off leash um, in my training. So it was a huge amount of, of training uh, skills as a kid, but I mean, we train dogs. And when I got him, I really struggled to train him. And so I found this book and it was super helpful. And one of the things that helped me is it lays out dominant or different personality types. So there's dominant, um, high drive mode, um, assertive or dominant. And so they, instead of just saying, oh, your dog is independent or your dog is dependent or different things like that, um, that I used to hear the terms that I don't even remember anymore, that it breaks them out to a, a number of different more roles. And one of the things that my assertive or or whatever dog, domineering, you know, all these negative dogs, he's not a submissive dog, is found out that he is actually independent. So some breeds of dogs like um, to, they're most happy when you are happy, right? So lab or a golden retriever are perfect examples of this. Their one goal is to make you happy. And if you do things like yell at them, they are like crushed, right? My dog is not crushed. I would yell at him at three months old or I would turn my back if he was biting me as a puppy, just like I had trained my other dogs with. And he would just not care, like literally not care that I was not paying attention to him. He just walked up and was like, that's fine. Like, I was trying to give you a, an opportunity to be with me, but if you don't want it on my terms, then I don't care. So he really um, was very independent in his assertiveness. And what I found for him is the most important thing for me to be with him is for him to be um, my, my we got we to gotta be in the pack together. He's got to know that I've got his back. Um, I'm paying attention to him. I care about him. And when he does, he's very, very smart and he will obey commands and do things like that. So um, number one thing that you want to do and care for your dog is learn what your dog is like. So the training the hard to train dog is a great book for that. I also recommend a book called, I realized last minute it was on my Kindle. Stop. Can you get your toy? Get your toy. Hey, do you want this? Um, it's called Think Like Your Dog and Enjoy the Rewards by Diana Young. And this person really looks at what, what is body language for dogs, and I loved that. Um, so one cue that I give my dog, so here's a, and all my ramblings were coming to a point. Uh, one of the things that is so helpful for him, for me, because in his independence, if he gets to where he feels like he's the leader, he'll get really anxious. But he, he does that anxious in that aggressive way, right? Um, and he'll try to domineer me or take charge of the situation, be on high alert, all of those things that we've seen our dogs do. Well, looking at this book talks about, you know, what that is, what the body language of a dog is, is basically what she talks about. And one of the things you can do when your dog is really stressed is yawn. That lets them know that it's okay. You are safe, you are comfortable, 
you don't have worries. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that can be helpful when your dog is being really aggressive with you is actually just to turn your back on them. So dogs that are, are being, I don't want to say submissive, but who know they have nothing to fear from the other dog and aren't worried or, or trying to stand up for their ground or are trying to show, I, I'm, I'm not going to fight you. So fighting is straight on. Turning a little bit, <coughs> um, that's going to be a sign of submission, a sign of, I don't, I don't fear you. Um, I'm not worried. I'm not trying to attack you. I, I turn my back to you. I trust you. So those are some body languages that I use a lot with Padfoot. Um, sorry, I talked a lot today. <coughs> um, and when he's stressed, so one of the things he had a bad experience with, I had a smoke alarm just outside of my shower, my bathroom, and many times I set off the smoke alarm when he was a pretty young puppy um, when I was showering. So now when I turn on the shower, he gets very stressed. So I put, I put him near me and I yawn after the shower's on, just let him know it's okay. I'm going to yawn again here. So there's things like that. So tips, yawning is huge. Make sure he's seeing you. Um, and oftentimes they will yawn afterwards. And you can't see he's excited about his toy, but he did calm down a couple of notches when I yawned. I was all excited. I was rushing around grabbing my books, and he picked up on that energy. So I sat down. I noticed what his behavior was, and I did cues that he understands in his language to help him calm back down. So when I added the facial or the body language cues, it was very helpful um, in addition to any kind of verbal cues that we could be having. Okay, so Think Like Your Dog is the book that talks about the cues. Um, I got that on Amazon, on Kindle. Um, and then How to Train the Hard to Train Dog is the one, Training the Hard to Train Dog, sorry, is the one that talks about the different dog types um, in much uh, more broken down categories than most people talk about dogs. Okay, now we need to look at time and attention and continuity. Um, again, the reason why I opened about what is your dog like is all of these factors um, are going to be in, they need to be uh, funneled, if you will, through the filter of what is my dog like. Um, if your dog loves going with the flow and it doesn't bother him and you're like now home more, and this is the best thing that ever happened, that is great, right? So that emotional aspect of what he's feeling is going or is going to be much lessened than a dog who got really used to routine, enjoys that evening walk, kind of watches the clock, knows the time. Um, that dog is going to have a lot harder time in this transition uh, that a lot of us have made. And in the future, you will make bringing home a new baby, right? You're going to have new people in the house, different pattern. You're going to move. All of those things are going to happen. So knowing your dog and knowing what their cues are is really, really helpful. Okay. Next, once we know a cue, we have this trigger of, oh, something's wrong. So then we go to the next step of, of support and care, right? So first off, I think diet. <laughs> Shocker. You guys thought you'd get through a whole lecture without me talking about gaps, but you were wrong. Um, so gaps diet can be helpful. This is more reserved for dogs who are, are sick in some way. Um, you can do gaps diet for dogs. That's all I'll say about it. Um, but the things that help us as people with stress tolerance, which are animal fat, um, we can do uh, good minerals and salts are important. We need to be clean of toxins. We need B vitamins. Um, all of those physical things that we need, dogs need as well. So even if you do normal pet food for your dog, you can add those things. Have them lick your plates um, with your nice animal fats. Great way to not waste it. Saves your drains. Win, win, win. Right. Um, we can do minerals. You can do a mineral water like an El Dorado water um, is one that we have locally to be able to give minerals in. You could put some salt in the food or salt um, on, on the floor or in a bowl somewhere where they can have access to a little bit of minerals and do kind of a salt lick. Um, the other thing is B vitamins and maybe throwing some liver um, in once a week. Maybe a piece like this for my dog, a bigger piece for a bigger dog, obviously. Throwing that into their normal bowl or their normal routine once a week just to give them some B vitamins. Raw is totally great. Dogs do raw really well. So those are some thoughts and some ideas about what you could do for um, just basic support across the board. Um, when we have a well-nourished body, 
in a well-rested body, we can deal with things better, right? We know that. If you're tired or hungry, how well do you deal with things versus if you are well-fed, you had a good night's sleep, it's coming off the weekend, right? You are going to be able to tolerate stress better. The cool thing about stress tolerance is it is changeable. We can increase our stress tolerance mostly by the way we eat and then sometimes by emotional things, um, supporting our emotional hormonal balance of things. Let's see, what else do I want to say about food? Oh, there are some foods. Um, if you do feed foods off your plate to your dog, I just wanted to mention there are foods that are not okay for that. Um, we want to be careful around onions. Uh, too many onions can really overwhelm um, the, I believe it's the liver. They don't break down the sulfates, I believe, um, very well. That's the same with egg whites. You really don't want to do a ton of egg whites, especially raw. That's just true for all. That's true for us, too, as people. Uh, macadamia nuts is one that I don't usually remember. So don't. some nuts are good for dogs, but macadamia nuts are not. Um, avocado is okay in small amounts, but you do want to be careful. Again, there's a substance in that that their livers particularly don't really have as strong of a power to break down. It's probably just not something that they naturally um, encounter in their natural food, um, you know, as, as canines. Um, so they didn't need to have that, um, that enzyme for that. Xylitol, this is a huge one. Um, xylitol is very poisonous to dogs. It can cause liver failure, I believe seizures. I can't remember. I was just looking at what that one caused um, before we came on here. So xylitol, you definitely want to make sure there's nothing that you are eating, um, that you're feeding your dog xylitol or that his treats don't have xylitol or things like that. Um, xylitol is now a healthy sugar. Um, so it is in things that you may think of as healthy or not take a second thought about because maybe you're eating it, but I do not recommend it for dogs. Um, I don't really recommend it for people either, but it is a better alternative than some. Um, so there may be things you eat with xylitol, but don't feed it to your dog. Toxin versus poison is an important thing to look at. So there are things that are toxic to dogs, like chemicals, like ibuprofen, like, well, any drugs, which are chemicals. Um, Tylenol, I mean, it's the, the toxic one. So toxins mean there's, there's damage. This is a hundred percent something, um, uh, toxic to the, sorry, poisonous to the body. And then there's toxin. So poison and toxin. Poison is, it's poisonous. Antifreeze is poisonous, right? That, that kills us. We can't break it down. Um, dogs can't break it down. They're going to have to, um, hopefully not get too much of a dose or they potentially will die or have, you know, liver or kidney failure. And then on the other side, we have um, toxins, which are things that are difficult for the body to deal with. And if they build up, can cause a lot of harm. So things like onions are toxic, not poisonous. Um, if your dog gets a little bit of onion, my dog gets a little bit of onion um, in licking off my plate sometimes or in meat stock sometimes. But I try not to give him things that have onions in them. Okay, another big uh, no-no is chocolate. Most people know that. Um, that one is also toxic, not poisonous. So if your dog gets a little bit, it's um, probably going to be okay, but definitely want to avoid them eating that. Um, and then raisins, grapes, those um, are very, they can cause uh, liver failure in dogs and um, should be avoided to do. Okay. Things that are not dog food. Dogs do not naturally eat grains very much. Again, if they were out in a field or, you know, ate a little piece of bread on the street, like, that's going to be there. But um, grains are not a normal part of a dog's diet. So they're scavengers to some extent, but they're going to catch animals and eat meat. That's going to be their preferred way. So just like with us, if we don't have properly prepared grains, that can be harmful and, and uh, difficult for our body to digest. In the same way, if dogs are getting a diet of foods that are not right for their bodies, um, they're going to have trouble digesting. Um, they're going to have health issues. They're not going to have as much uh, nutrition um, and strength in their bodies. So one of the things, um, one, one great book that you could learn more about this, it was actually done on cats. Um, and I know I'm talking mostly about dogs, and I will emphasize the differences in cats. I don't know about cats' body language, 0%. I am decently allergic enough that I've never really been able to live with a cat. So I... I don't know what cat's body language are. I haven't looked at books on that. Um, 
I don't know what their stress levels are. I know that they, of course, can have stress. I know they respond differently, right? Um, so also horses, those they're very sensitive to our feelings and emotions. Um, a, a ferret is going to be. Those make great therapy animals. So I know that ferrets are going to have some amount of degree um, of sensitivity to uh, your, your emotional state, right? So hopefully you know your pets and know what's going on, um, with them. Feed them the right diet. Pottinger's cats. Um, I left that book at the office. I don't have it, but Pottinger's cats. Pottinger did a study on cats that he fed them different, uh, diets. Some were totally cooked, totally pasteurized milk. Some were totally raw, totally raw milk. And some were halfway in the middle. And he studied the effects that that different nutrition than what they were made for had on their bodies. And it, it was a negative effect that affected both their physical health, like cardiovascular disease. Um, the next generation had a lot of deformities or a lot of birth defects or um, were small, small boned. Um, you know, the jaw was smaller things like that. And then the third generation, none of them survived past six months and they were all sterile. So when we don't give our body the food that it needs really, um, really well, we're not going to have um, as healthy of a body. So we see a lot of cancer in pets now. Um, it makes sense to me. We're not feeding the body well. We're feeding toxins. We're feeding inflammatory grains. So what can you do about that? Um, you know, it depends on how many dogs you have, what your budget is. I'm not going to make that decision for you, but there is a book if you do feel like you want to do raw. Um, it's called National Nutrition for Cats and Dogs. Um, and this I, I got, it has a breakdown per size of animal of how much of different foods to feed them. So this is the base that I go um, for my dog. And then they have some different supplements in it. Um, like, uh, what's it called? Seaweed powder, like liver powder, like vitamin C powder. Um, and it, it gives you a clue for what things you may not be finding in the normal diet that you need to uh, supplement with. I supplement with a different supplement than they um, recommend, but I mean, it's basically the same, right? Okay. So national nutrition for cats and dogs. Going off of the food topic, so we can feed our bodies well and our dog's bodies and our pet's bodies well, feeding them a diet that is food that is good for their body, and that is going to allow them to be uh, healthy and deal with stress better and, and be responsive and flexible in a better way than if they were feeding something else. In Pottinger's cats, I forgot to mention, not only did they see the physical effects, but they saw emotional effects. Um, there were, uh, a, the, the cats that weren't fed well were more aggressive. Um, they would beat up on each other, especially the females and the males actually became more docile and actually, um, exhibited homosexual tendencies. So it's really interesting what emotional and, and mental chemical hormonal, whatever you want to call it effects that we saw with the dogs when, or the cats, when, um, he fed them in the study. So, um, when, if your dog is just very high stressed or very aggressive, it may be something to consider, um, doing a different diet or adding at least some different good foods into their diet for them. Okay. Time and attention was what I wrote down after we discussed what is your pet's personality? What do you know what they like to do? Can you notice the cues if they're stressing out? And what are you going to do about him um, finding those different calming things? So time and attention. Time and attention is sometimes what you need. You need to sit down on the floor. Yesterday, I took the last 45 minutes of a call I was on sitting on the floor because my dog just needed me to be down instead of up on the table. Um, so sometimes it's just time. Be with them. Other times it is full attention, which Padfoot would appreciate much more full attention than he's getting right now. Um, but he is um, needing that attention. Now that attention can come in several ways. It can be on my terms um, and my decision of what it is, which is great, but is it also on, on, on in a helpful way for him? Um, so if it's not a helpful way for him, like I would like to cuddle him right now, let's just say, but he really he has some energy that he wants to get out. So he wants to go on a walk or he wants to chase a ball. For some dogs, going on a walk is actually detrimental because they get stressed out, they get hyper aroused, they're too excited. Now they need to get calmed down, which they already weren't anyway. They were, so it, it, even though it's happy anxiety, it actually adds to their anxiety. So if you're noticing your dog is more stressed when you go on a walk, maybe a walk is not a great thing. 
head popped up when I said that. So maybe that's not the best thing for your dog and you need to throw a stick in the backyard or just play, play chase. Don't chase him. You chase, you let them chase you. Um, maybe doing a toy, getting a, an ear chew or something like that um, is going to be helpful. Um, as I've been home a lot more, especially this past weekend, my dog loves to be out and to be stimulated. And so when there were hours and hours and hours of him not being stimulated and no one walks by her house and all of that, I don't blame him for being bored, right? And, and there's some breeds that are much more known for that where they are chewing the walls. He's like literally eating the walls because they're so bored and they don't know what to do with themselves. So we do want to make sure that we are providing for our breed of dog and our personality of our dog, um, setting them up for success. So food will set them up for success. Um, watching our mood and being aware of our mood will set them up for success and giving them attention. So my dog loves to learn. Poodles are working dogs um, and he is much more poodle than Shih Tzus. Shih Tzus are lap dogs and like they think half a block walk three times a week is the best exercise you could get. So, um, but that is not Padfoot. He does not, um, is that your name? Yeah, he does not fall into the Shih Tzu camp. He's a poodle. So I got these books, um, agility training. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. So that's when dogs are running through hoops and tires and sitting on platforms and things like that. And it's really a city city way. Um, I mean, everyone does it, but it's really a city way for me to get my dog to be a working dog when I don't have sheep for him to herd, right? And so with that, um, there's a few things you can do. I like this book. It's dog... Agility Equipment Construction Instructions. So it's a $10 or $15 book that I picked up that does with PVC pipe and card uh, particle board how to make the different agility things so you don't have to go to a, a rink and a court. Um, so here's how you make a hoop, right? So these are the different things that can be helpful. That's really fun. Um, and then I bought the three-part series that is the techniques of agility training. Um, and Padfoot loves to do that. So we sit on a platform, he jumps over things, and he can do tunnels. That's what we've done. I've just been working on things at home. You can also do agility classes. And I know one dog in particular, um, he really struggled with a lot of, he's a big dog, a lot of energy needed something to do with his brain. And doing agility, his, his owner took him twice a week, I think, to do agility. And that was it, it was a game changer. Their relationship was different, and that's been true for Padfoot. Um, when I engage with him, which it's been a week probably because it snowed and I couldn't go out and do tunnels and jumping like I normally can do, um, it's been a week, and he needs that connection of we're doing something together, and I give you a job, and I trust you with this job, and I want you to run um, through this tunnel because I told you, and I'm going to reward you because you did great, and we're working as a team. So um, for him, for his personality breed, that's great. For my parents' dog that's Shih Tzu, his dad, pff, no. Like, there's there's absolutely no way that that would be fun or helpful to him. So, again, there's no right answer in here. It's just knowing what is your dog, what are some things, and getting outside the box. Um, there is a, a 25 days of homeschool that he and I have started doing Um that they put together a dog course that I do on absolutedogaithink.com. Um, and that's been really helpful. They're really fun, upbeat um, people that do just a quick little game. Um, there is a game for that. It's kind of their mantra. And that is something that we found really helpful. And it's there's games for doing behaviors to, to trick them, if you will, out of behaviors, to train, to play a game out of the behavior that you don't like. Um, rewarding for, for non-issues, like every time the mailman walks by, reward them. And so that they expect happy reward from you instead of needing to direct their attention to the mailman to get, um, you know, to get some of their energy out. So it's just changing what their behaviors are, engaging with you in a game, um, particularly to stop some of the bad behaviors that are happening, like running away or chasing after squirrels. So they have a podcast also. It's called Sexier Than a Squirrel. Um, so it's pretty fun, pretty fun people. So that's a great resource to do for your dog. And they train all sorts of dogs um, eventually to be off lead usually because you they want to be with you so much. All right. Uh, nutrition. Time and attention. So find what your dog needs. Don't over attend to them. Um, and then they, these absolute dog people, the sexier than a squirrel, they do talk a lot about 
noticing the arousal of your dog, meaning how how anxious, even if it's good anxiety, are they? And then there's different games or things that you do depending on if they're really aroused or if they're really low um, and they're they're calm but excited. So those are things that we can look at. Okay. The last things I want to talk about today, um, as I said, this is going to be a shorter class, are essential oils, flower essences, and supplements, particularly. So we already saw a demonstration of the supplement. I'll probably do it again because I think he still really wants more Cataplex G. Cataplex G is the one that he loves and always wants. <laughs> Cataplex G is the calming B vitamin, so this is something. I do standard process with him. There are canine lines, so he will often get canine whole body. Um, or canine enteric, which is a stomach one, because poodles have stomach issues. He is a very domesticated dog, so sometimes he really can struggle with the raw food diet, even though he loves it. I think he just doesn't have the enzymes that turn on as well, even though he's done raw food since pretty much weaning, um, but it's okay. A um, little bit of support, and his body, his coat, and he's clearly healthier for that food. So again, when we're, when we're testing something that is, is this something he wants? Um, we same thing for any essential oil, um, any kind of supplement. We want to just open it. Okay. Okay. He's like, it's not out of the bottle. So can you come up? Up. Yeah. Okay. So smelling it and letting him take it. This is true across all types of animals. Um, Again, cats are a little bit, they have a very different metabolism, so that's going to be a little different of a thing. But um, horses do this. Horses will lick and, uh, and chomp if they want something that you are presenting to them. So anytime I am going to put something on him um, that's a, a essential oil or a flower essence, I'm going to check with him to see if it is good. Now, there are times when I only have lavender and he is stressed out, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of lavender on even if he's not looking for it, right? But I try really hard not to do that. Okay. Um, I forgot to grab both an essential oil bottle and a flower essence bottle, so that's a bummer. But um, so essential oil bottle, same thing. I'm going to have him smell it um, with him being able to see. And then if he likes it, um, this is different from cats, okay? Cats are a different category, but for everything else, um, as far as, as far as I know, for any other regular pet, at least that I see, um, when I read about pets and how they deal with things here, by the way, is a great book, holistic aromatherapy for animals. So this talks not only about what things to use, but it also talks about how to use them, how, how much you want to dilute. So horses take less of a dose or the same dose as a human does. Their metabolism is so much more sensitive to this natural substance we're putting on to them, excuse you, um, that we want to do less. Dogs are the same. So if I'm putting um, oils on Padfoot, I may, if I don't have another option, I'll put one, I'll like get some on my hand and just rub it on his back, on his spine here, right? And then sometimes I'll put it on the paws of his feet, but I'm very careful to never do that if it's a hot oil. So if it's oregano, rosemary, thyme, um, clove, on guard, anything like that, I'm not going to put it on his pads because pads, are, they're a very um, sensitive place. So I will just put that here. The other thing that's always great is to do aromatherapy. Um, this is a completely safe way to do pet therapy. Is a, uh, Aromatherapy is to do it in the air, in a diffuser, and then give your pet the option to be away. So um, not trap him in a room. Don't ever leave a diffuser running in your bedroom with your cat locked in your bedroom, especially a cat, because um, they have no way to get away and that could cause significant um, issues. Cats in general don't do well with oils on them. There, there are some that you can do. There's a, a much bigger list of oils that cats can't do, whereas most other animals, um, that it's very okay to do. Dogs, horses, um, the use of it is just the same as in humans. I'm um, trying to find the page I want, and I'm probably not going to find it very fast. That's okay. So I have a Modern Essentials book. This is an old edition. It's still great. And so these are great books because you can reference what essential oil that does. So I can look up by symptom here in the back, and I can say, okay, anxiety. And these do have a separate section for pets as well. 
um, which is something to look at if you have one with it. Um, also, again, this holistic book, but if this is all you have or something like this and you don't have it, um, we go nausea, right? So nausea, ginger, peppermint, lavender. Um, that makes sense, right? We know that for nausea. So if Padfoot is nauseous, I will put a little digestive blend on him, digest then, or I'll put some peppermint. And in this case, I put, again, just on the bottle, just a little bit of a thing, and then I just put it on the hair, but just really lightly. I'm not rubbing it in. I'm not trying to get skin contact. I'm just getting it where it's almost aromatically going into the skin part um, near where I want it to have an effect. So that's what we're going to do. Now, that's the, well, we'll say lazy way um, or the, the, the uh, don't have another option way. The better way anytime you are putting essential oils on pets would be to dilute it. And it's a, it's a fairly significant dilution. Um, I forgot to look up to re-remind myself exactly what that dilution was. Um, you can definitely find that different places. But in general, if you're thinking this much carrier oil, you're going to do a drop in there. You know, it's a pretty significant dilution. Um, again, you can put them on what's called neat without diluting them. And also, if you only have a little bit of coconut oil that you want to put in your hand with the drop on there you can do that that's going to be better than no dilution but it would be better to actually pretty significantly dilute it so if you're making a roller ball you may fill it this full, full with I don't know if you can see the this full with um, carrier oil and then put one drop of the three different oils that you're doing for your anxiety blend or something like that so um, very they have a strong effect on dogs um, horses um, and other kind of four-legged mammals, except cats. Cats have a very different uh, liver processing system, so you have to be careful, and there's a lot of things that cats don't deal with. It's why catnip is so uh, potentially dangerous to cats and so stimulating to cats, is their, their body just doesn't break down those aromatic compounds that it's getting, um, so it kind of makes them go a little crazy, and that's just what happens. That's that toxic effect, so oils can be toxic to pets much easier to get toxic effect in cats but they can be toxic to dogs toxic to horses so you do want to make sure that you're not getting your pet toxic with using essential oils okay flower remedies so these are homeopathic remedies um i don't i don't know i would imagine but i literally don't know if you can do like the pearl homeopathics if anyone knows for sure tell us in the comments um, but the little white sugar pellets, I don't know if you can do those or not. I would assume you could, but um, I do use uh, Bach flower remedies pretty often. So Bach, B-A-C-H, flower remedies. And if you go to their website, they have all their remedies listed out. I think there's 17 or something like that. And then each of the remedy, like walnut, oak, rose, whatever, um, they have the emotional state that your body or your pet's body would be in that would recommend you to put this remedy on. Um, homeopathics work in the energetic field, meaning there is a electromagnetic stamp on the liquid that that homeopathic is in. So they take an oak tree, for example, and they take, I don't know if it's the leaves or the stem or what, but they take whatever they do, they put it in water, and then they succuss it, succuss it, which is hitting, and then they dilute it, succuss and dilute. So eventually you get a place where there's no actual oak in that water because you've diluted it so many times, but because of the action of succussion, you've actually stamped that water with the electrical imprint of oak. So you use homeopathics for many, many things. Um, but that's in essence what you're doing. Well, what's really cool is all, all of everything vibrates at some frequency. This pen is vibrating at a frequency. My heart cells are vibrating at a different frequency than my liver cells. My phone and the EMFs coming from my phone are causing a vibrational frequency and we're all interacting with each other. That's how pets really can sense what we're at. He's now conked out. He needed that extra G. So when my vibrational frequency is certain thing, dogs and horses who are very sensitive to that are going to notice. So the homeopathic world is a great world to be working on um, to help with that, that kind of calming effect when your pets are going through stressors. So what I'd recommend is to go on to bachflowerremedy.com or whatever it is 
read through those descriptions, pick the best one for you and the best one for your pet. And hopefully there's one that could maybe be for both. Um, or you could put what you're putting on you on your dog in addition to the one on your dog. It's helpful to help make that congruent so that you are in, in their electrical um, uh, frequencies are, are getting the same input. And then that will really help. So <clears throat> Star of Bethlehem is a great one to do, both for humans and for dogs. I put that on Padfoot the most. Again, I don't know anything about cats with homeopathic, so I apologize for that. But I know other things. I know horses and ferrets, and I know all of those other ones. To my knowledge, I've never seen anything against that. Obviously, if you have something besides the dog, which I have the most research in, please just double check. But And horses and dogs seem to be the most similar in that. So I use Star of Bethlehem a lot. Star of Bethlehem is, helps to lessen the impact of shock, grief, or stress, or something like that. This is very helpful if something just hit you, um, right? So you got that phone call, you got an email, and your just whole body went like this, right? Stress response. So <clears throat> Star of Bethlehem is really helpful for that. If there's something that you feel like happened to your dog, um, the shower, the, the fire alarm going off and the shower is going, right? That stress response, the, the Star of Bethlehem helps bring that energetic frequency back to a place of calm and rest. It's particularly helps to counteract or balance, bring balance to that um, the shock grief that's just hitting up. Oak is another one I put on a lot and I put on myself a lot. Oak trees are very strong, right? So the essence of oak is a strength, um, but oak helps us to feel that we can be strong, but also let other people help us. We don't have to be constantly bearing the full burden. That's another one I put on him a lot because he will often, when he's uncomfortable, step into the role of, well, I, I'll just be in charge. I will fix this. I'll make us feel better. Um, and so oak I'll put on. And again, when I do, I often do three drops under my tongue. It's just my standard um, or occasionally drop a drop on my head. Um, I will do the same thing to him. I will drop a drop on his head, not internally. I'll drop a drop on his head and then I'll put that on his head and wipe it down the rest of his backbone. So his body gets this electrical signal right along his electrical system of the spinal cord, right? To help bring balance to the body. Uh, it's pretty been pretty cool watching um, different dogs response to this, not just my dog, but other dogs. Um, I often find that they will um, lick a lot when they're doing, when, when I first put those on, um, even though I didn't give it to them in their mouth. They also will often go drink a lot of water, um, which is a very calming, soothing, things are safe kind of signal. Um, and then they often just fall asleep. So the other thing that I do, Pat, but I hate to wake you up. The other thing that I do um, and have been taught by uh, a, a person who does NET, which is neuroemotional technique for humans, but he sometimes does it for pets. Um, and he will do it for my pet sometimes, which has been very helpful. So... Oh, he's so calmed down. So what he was teaching me, there you can we can do some emotional clearing. So NET is neuroemotional technique that helps clear emotions that are wrong. I'm sorry, I'll get you back in just a second. But what I want to do, so I take his face here. I don't know if you can see his eyes. Um, but I'm going to put my hands right. Should have done this when he was being crazy. I'm going to put my fingers right above his, right here, right above his eyebrows. And then I'm going to tap the top of his head to connect the sutures. Hold on, bud. Can you show us? Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Usually, there we go. Usually he's really calm and he actually really loves this. Um, so I'm just tapping on his head, up and down, kind of to the base of his neck, to the top of his head. So you're connecting the two emotional points that are in dogs, and then I'm tapping the sutures to kind of bring that together and bring some balance. What do you think? Is that nice? Yeah, so that is how you do it. Hopefully you can see, sorry, my dog is black. <laughs> um, hopefully you can see that. And often after we go, um, I take him to go get cleared, he will sleep so well. He'll take a nap right away. Um, his body's just relaxed to that place, um, which he is in a very relaxed place now. So that's all I got for you. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> um, I Again, I'm not I'm not a veterinary, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I own a dog, and that's pretty much it. But I have done some study about essential oils. I have done some study about re flower essences. 
Um, I thought about doing, you know, can I do a whole sheet or list off a whole bunch of things, but truly the way you use essential oils and flower essences for your dog or, or your other pets are the same way you use it for you. There's nuances, so I don't want to say something wrong um, or have you write it down wrong. So I'd rather you go to resource books and sources as you are supporting your pets. So in brief review about what we're doing, um, number one, know your dog. What is their personality type? Know when their cues are showing that they're not doing well, right? Number two, find ways to help them do better. What do you, what does your dog or pet like? Um, I'm sorry, I can't speak in any of these areas to cats. <laughs> so I'm going to just say dog for the moment or, or horse, right? What are things that your pet does? Um, is it sitting on the ground? Is it playing a game? Is it playing fetch? Is it um, having, you know, two minutes, sometimes I get three, I break up my tree into three or four pieces. I throw it on the ground. I call his name. I say, yes, I give him another treat. I throw it on the ground. I call his name. I say, yes, give him another treat. And he is golden for an hour. That's all the attention he needed right then. But I had to do a focused attention on him um, so that he could feel whatever included part of the pack, whatever is going through his brain. So know what calms your dog down. No, it doesn't have to be a huge question what you're doing. Are walks helpful? Um, is playing ball helpful? Uh, is playing tug of war helpful? Um, how often is he winning? How often are you winning? All of these things send signals. And depending on the, t the, the breed and personality of your dog, um, my dog needs to know I am strong um, and in charge or he gets very anxious. Other dogs are going to, the submissive dogs, you don't have to be that strong and in charge or they just feel like they're, you know, tail between their legs in trouble all the time. So you have to know what your dog wants and watch for their cues of when they're not okay. When you notice they're not okay, first go to time and attention. Think about, you know, or, or just see, can I give attention? Can I give time? Right? So I, I did that first with him um, as we were going. I also knew I, I messed things up because I brought the supplements down without giving them to him. So he got super aroused, right? Super high energy positive energy for him, but that can turn into anxiety or that can just stress us out. Just like for us in our bodies, if we're super high energy and excited, that still depletes our energy systems because we're using so much in that excitement. Okay. So notice, know your dog, notice your dog, give time and attention first, then look at supporting their body baseline with healthy nourishing foods, potentially a raw food diet or a cooked food diet. You have to be careful because nutrients are less or just supplementing a good quality kibble with um, liver, fat, salt, that kind of thing. I would recommend following guidelines from books where they've actually parceled out what a dog needs so that you don't end up with a nutritional deficiency accidentally. Um, if you have some supplements and there are certain behaviors or things, I mean, that's my study, so it's, it's fairly easy for me to know I need Cataplex G for him. Um, he just needs it a lot. Vitamin A, C, he'll get a reverse sneeze thing. So I know his lungs need some A and C. So I'll, I'll give these different things. However, you can also just have them smell it. See which ones they want to take um, when you offer them to them. Okay, then we go to the more medicine quotation mark treatments, which would be the essential oils and flower essences. These would be things that you would do to support when there is a hopefully short term imbalance, right? So long term, if your dog's stressed out all the time, I would change something about how they're eating or how you're interacting with them. Do they need walks? Do they need more walks or less walks, right? So if it's a baseline thing and their environment is stressful to them, I would dig deeper into that. If they're just terrified of fireworks on July 4th, you can just go ahead and help them with that, right? And that's where aromatherapy, essential oils diluted, and um, flower essences, homeopathics can come in to help go, ooh, something happened. Um, or I'm taking a shower every, you know, twice a week and something happened that he's stressed out with. So I'm going to, if my cues of yawning aren't enough and he's really anxious, I'm going to go ahead and, and do something like a lavender or a, a um, walnut or something. Walnut helps us adapt to change. That's really important right now. <laughs> everyone should be probably, everyone should be taking some walnut homeopathic right now. So walnut helps us adapt to change. So those, those are things that I'm thinking of. So same things I think for me, I'm going to think for him. Um, more diluted, less often. He gets essential oils 
once a month and he gets flower essences maybe once a day. Um, depends on how stressed I am usually or how stressed he is. Um, there are certain foods that are toxic to dogs, so remember that um, and, and cats as well. Essential oils, more essential oils are toxic to cats. If you have a cat, make sure you find a book like this or look up lists that are reputable to make sure you're not putting things on cats that you um, shouldn't. And in general, with cats, we just do aromatherapy with the option to escape from the room. And that includes if you're doing aromatherapy for yourself. And say you want lemongrass, for example. Lemongrass, if I remember right, is not great for cats. So you want to make sure that they are able to get to a different room where you're not overwhelming their bodies with the chemical signal of lemongrass aromatically. Okay. And, yep. Wow, I needed one more point with the way I had that sentence, but I didn't. So there's the class. I hope that you enjoyed learning some things about supporting your pets. Um, I hope these were helpful resources to, to start digging in. Again, I love that body language one I talked about at the beginning. Um, it's called Think Like Your Dog and Enjoy the Rewards. Um, and then the Training the Hard to Train Dog, those were the two that were in the nutrition book. Um, those were all very, very helpful to me um, to figure out how to start working on specifically helping my dog. Um, and the baseline of, again, just like with people, I treat essential oils as, as acute symptom treatments to help get through something specific. Baseline needs to be what's the environment, what's the mood, um, what's the food, right? Those things need to be addressed. So there you go. Okay. Any questions? Why I wait for any questions that people may have? Um, thanks for being on. A few of you stuck with me the whole time. That was great. Um, hope that that was helpful. Uh, so any questions, you can go ahead and type them in. Otherwise, this goes live and feel free to share it if it was helpful and good. I'm more insecure about this one than I normally am. It's fine. It's not going to bother me, but um, I'm, I'm not a vet. So, And if you feel like you want to donate and support our educational activities, you can go to our website, Be Well Clinic dot net slash events and then any donate button under any of the classes will take you to a donate page that um, you can put in an amount and help us to continue teaching classes so um, that's totally an extra thing but uh, we'll mention it and thank you all for being here that's all i have have a good night bye